Hi, everyone. I'm John Weinberg, CEO of Startup Hut, and this is episode number two of Startup Hut's live streamed investing show, Pitch Party. And I'll be your host. For those of you who have tuned in in the past, welcome back. And for those first timers out there, thank you so much for joining. If you're not familiar with Startup Hut, I'll quickly break it down for you in the simplest way possible. Our sole focus is to help more and more entrepreneurs around the world access capital, mentorship, customers, talent, and much, much more. Look, we know how hard it is to start a company. It's really, really tough. Our goal is to provide support and help make it a hell of a lot easier, just one entrepreneur at a time. Now, obviously, I can't tackle all of this by myself, so I wanted to extend some thank yous uh, before we get started. First, uh, to the startups brave enough to come on this show, hats off to them. To every single one of you tuning in live or watching the recording, we appreciate your time. To our partner and amazing crowdfunding platform, WeFunder. To our panelists, Eric Bullen, who's an angel investor and limited partner at Mendoza Ventures, and David Mendez, managing partner at Good Growth Capital. And now last, but certainly not least, my co-founder, George Lee, who refuses, and I mean refuses to be on camera, but absolutely crushes a production. Anyway, thank you again to everyone I just mentioned. None of this would be possible without you. So now to all the newbies watching, let me explain how this whole thing is going to work. We have five startups pitching. Each company has about a three-minute pitch lined up for you to watch. After their pitch, there'll be a 10-minute Q&A where each panelist will ask a few questions, and if there's time, we'll source some questions from the audience, so don't hold back in that chat. Hopefully, the companies will impress you enough to warrant checking out their WeFunder page. If so, there will be a link following the pitch that you can check out. Now, after all five startups have their chance to pitch, we'll conclude with a quick roundup where our panelists will get feedback and do a review of the startups. So real quick, uh, WeFunder. I mentioned them a few times and some of you might know who they are, but others might be scratching their head thinking, well, who are they? So for those not familiar, they are a crowdfunding platform that connects startups with investors and is predicated upon the idea that anyone, regardless of wealth, whether you're accredited or unaccredited, should be able to invest in a startup company. And personally, I love that. Everyone out there in the audience, I encourage you, use the chat room. If you don't have a question, that's cool. Comment something nice, point out any observations you may have. But more importantly, what we want is for you to sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Okay. I'm sick of hearing myself talk, and I'm sure you all are too, so let's dive right in. Um, first up, we have B Mortgage pitching their mortgage app. Hey, everybody. My name is Curtis Wood. I'm the co-founder and CEO of B Mortgage app, which is the first mobile mortgage app with an end-to-end, soup-to-nuts mobile mortgage experience. We're building it for the flood of first-time home buyers entering the marketplace uh, these are millennials. They're the largest home buying group this year. We're mobilizing mortgages with it, and our mission is to make home ownership more accessible and affordable for the average person. I want you to think back to the last time you bought a house. Getting a mortgage wasn't so easy, was it? You got to deal with the loan officer, deal with the bank, submit multiple documents. Now imagine doing all that on your phone. No faxes, no emails, no hold music, no loan officer, no need to leave your couch. B Mortgage App is the first mobile mortgage app built by a team experienced in mobile app development, mortgage lending, and AI ML and blockchain automation. Today's current legacy technology is not built to support a mobile mortgage. It's reliant on human decisioning to clear data and clear milestones as well. This is why you got to talk to a loan officer and a processor after you apply with Rocket Mortgage. So B is using AI and blockchain to completely replace the loan officer and automate loan origination. We pull, va pull data from third-party sources. We use AI to read and extract the data and then a smart contract to validate that it meets minimum loan product qualifying standards. 
This type of automation will get you a pre-approval and we estimate about three minutes. With this type of automation, we'll be able to increase loan production capacity while maintaining cost and be able to acquire a customer at a third the cost of other lenders in any rate environment. This automation will certainly change the $4 trillion mortgage industry forever. It'll provide a complete mobile mortgage experience with a process driven by the consumer, not the loan officer. It'll give them lower rates, faster turnaround times, and it'll be less risk for us, a direct mobile lender. Since we launched our MVP, which is a mortgage lead generating app, it helps new home buyers identify their ideal purchase price and payment. We launched iOS in September and recently passed over 2,500 downloads. We are in the middle of a seed round. Uh, after releasing our app on time and under budget in 2020, we moved on to a seed round, which is on WeFunder right now. And I'm happy to take any questions any of y'all might have. But I'm super lucky to be here, so thank you. All right. Well, that was a great pitch, Curtis. Um, thank you so much. Um, so we have the two panelists here, Eric, uh, David Mendez. Appreciate you both for coming on. Uh, let's start, Eric, since you are a returning panelist, I would love to start with you and hear some of your feedback or any questions that you might have for Curtis um, on his app. Sure. Uh, just say maybe a couple of questions to kick things off. Curtis, uh, you um, I think different a lot of companies, quite a few companies who've tried to reinvent the mortgage process, right? Origination process. What what makes you different from those other companies who have tried? Some of which have failed, and some which are doing a decent job at this point. Yes. Yeah, so first of all, the market's about four trillion, so there's a lot of business out there for multiple players to succeed. I have used. Mortgage Hippo, Blend, Rocket Mortgage. Uh, so some of the top point of sales in the industry. What separates us is that we are using an automation architecture that has AI and blockchain to decision data. This is the technology needed to support an end-to-end -end mobile mortgage that is not dependent on a human loan officer, which I used to be for TIAA Bank to process your 1003, your mortgage loan application. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so it's under, you're saying it's, it's essentially the underlying technology using AI right. uh, decisioning system, essentially, right? Uh, you get the training data to, to decide on whether you're going to provide this mortgage or not. Um, what's the reason for using blockchain in this case? Because it's a trusted validation protocol. Mm -hmm. the, re the reason we don't have a, a mobile mortgage in end is because lenders don't trust a computer program to do a job of a human to decision data, to validate data and clear milestones. And a lot of this data, specifically with the credit approval process, has to be accepted. It's got to be sourced from vendors, credit income and assets, and then it has to be accepted as is. So lenders can't change it. So a lot of times they're paying a loan officer you know, six figures to sit there and just clear a milestone, which a smart contract coded with minimum qualifying standards for a 30 year fixed can easily do in its place. Okay, thank you. I hand it over to uh, David and Jonathan. Yes, can you hear me? I can. Okay, great. Yes. Yeah, so what uh, I missed the very beginning of that pitch. Sorry about that, Curtis, but uh, I caught I caught the rest of it. But with anything like this, when you're disrupting a, a really a, what I call a value chain. So, you know, you have the bank, you have the mortgage broker, you have the, the consumer, the real estate agent and all these constituents. Where are you entering into this? I mean, are you it sounds like you're you're displacing the mortgage broker. Um, but, but I mean, are you going just direct to consumer? Are you working with brokers? Are you working through the mortgage bank channel or the real estate agency channels? So tell me how you enter. So uh, we're, we're creating a virtual loan officer and we're following the same B2C path that, and I hate to say their name today with it in light of everything going on, but Robinhood, Fair, you know, the same users that buy stocks and cars with Robinhood and Fair and Bank of Chime. Those are the users that are the, uh, the largest home buying segment this year. So we're going B2C. B2C personal finance apps have seen one of the greatest adoption rates. So really all the data is there. Behind millennials is Gen Z, Gen Z's first digitally native generation. We have an entire future 
of home buyers who are mobile reliant. So that's the path we're going, but our direct strategy is to be a direct mobile lender. So what you'll be holding in your hand is the loan officer. You will interface right. entirely with the app. It's funny you mentioned agents, because the mm -hmm. home buying process is a one a one time purchase until you move. The average person buys about eleven houses in their lifetime, so it's like every five or six years. But we are targeting real estate agents to set up a recurring revenue distribution channel with a contactless mortgage assistant. This three-minute type pre-approval, without having to lose their buyer to go talk to Wells Fargo and spend an hour and a half getting, you know, pre-approved, this is going to give them instant access in a super state market to get their, you know, their offer in faster uh, to beat out the next buyer that's right next to them. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Nice. Thanks, Curtis. I think I think the last thing. Um, Actually, one question for the chat. Would you consider B Mortgage almost like a lemonade for mortgages? It's just similar. There are some differences, but in terms of the network effect, yes. Okay, cool. And I think lastly, can you just tell us a little bit about your background in the team? Yeah, my background, I'm a licensed mortgage loan originator, and I was in mortgage lending for years. Um, after the crash, um, I got in in 2015. I was with PHH. We did white label loan origination for Merrill Lynch, Goldman Sachs, some some of the biggest investment banks. Um, I transitioned over to TIAA Bank, and then I started BAP. Before mortgage lending, I worked for iMobile 3, which is a mobile app developer. Uh, we built the Home Depot contractor app. So those are my two backgrounds. And the team's background we actually have experience in terms of blockchain and machine learning at the highest levels of academia. We just contracted some guys out of MIT. One of them's a rocket scientist. He's building the automation architecture for B app for these automated pre-approvals. And then my one partner who couch surfed when we didn't have any money to pay him, um, he couch surfed with us for about six months. He was project manager for another mortgage company that has a post-close mortgage application that utilizes blockchain. So we're pretty well, well rounded and everything, but I'm the mortgage guy who just happens to understand how blockchain works. Hey, uh, Jonathan, you mind if I ask one more question? Sure. So you're uh, Curtis, if I understand right, you're pre-revenue right now, you've got downloads, but, but no, no, uh, no revenue right now, or uh, we have a little bit of revenue. I think we're going to report 12,500, iOS went live in September, and that's the lion's share of our downloads. And we just passed 2,500 downloads about a week or two ago. All right, perfect. David, any other follow-up questions from you? I don't think so. That's covered it. Thank you. Cool. I, think, I think we've covered it. Thank you. All right, awesome. Well, appreciate thank you. it, guys. Uh, appreciate it big time. Uh, for those of you out there that like what Curtis had to say and want to learn more, uh, feel free to visit his WeFunder page. The link will be up following um, this panel room um, and up next um, for the pitches, we have Adam Limbs. Hi, I'm Tyler Hayes. I'm the CEO of Adam Limbs. At Adam Limbs, our mission is to cure death and disability by building Human Body 2.0. We make mind controlled artificial limbs. To start, we're making a mind controlled bionic arm called the Adam Touch, and every part of that's real. The mind control is real, the bionic is real, the arm is absolutely real. Now, over the past 50 years or so, robotics have come really far, but we haven't truly unlocked human-scale robotics yet. That changes now with the Atom Touch. The Atom Touch represents over 15 years of prototype R&D at Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, which was funded to the tune of around $100 million by the U.S. government. Now, that said, this is by no means just a lab bench prototype. This is an extremely advanced series of prototypes that have been field tested by dozens of amputees from a week to a month to a year long take home study. The Atom Touch is a leapfrog breakthrough five years ahead of any other product on the market in pretty much any way you can measure it. From our intuitive mind control where you just think and it moves as you intend without requiring any invasive brain surgery to individual finger control, which gives you the fluidity of a human hand to sense of touch feedback through force and pressure sensing. A few months ago, we came out of stealth mode and pretty quickly had a few hundred people uh, banging down the doors for our wait list. 
We've actually capped the wait list now and uh, are only working with the first couple hundred of those folks to get their feedback as we bring this product to market to them over the next couple of years. This market is sort of a sleeping giant opportunity. Uh, not a lot of people know this, but there's a very damning statistic. Only one out of five arm amputees use a prosthetic versus four out of five leg amputees use a prosthetic. And the reason for that disparity and lack of adoption in the arm amputees is quite simply, sadly, that the products are just nowhere near good enough for them. They do not recreate the functionality of the human hand. That's what the Atom Touch does. Our team has been shipping world-class products like this for decades on the consumer side from everything from co-creating the iPhone, iMac, and iPad to the medical side, the DaVinci Surgical Robot and Neuropace implants. The next 12 months for us on the hardware side look like continuing to move from clinical to production architecture that we can scale up when we go to market in a couple years. On the software side, continue to advance the deep learning and artificial intelligence so that our users can put this thing on even faster and use it even quicker. To the market side, letting even more of those folks banging down our doors get access to this, as well as uh, all the inbound interest we have from clinical partnerships getting clinicians and prosthetists access to this so they can give it to their patients. We set out initially to augment our current funding with a million dollars on WeFunder. We've actually already oversubscribed that, but we are more than happy to continue letting folks participate over the next couple weeks. The future for us is not just arms. We've already got line of sight on how to repurpose this technology to legs and beyond. And if that future of building Human Body 2.0 is exciting to you, we'd absolutely love to have you on this ride with us. And as COVID eases up and restrictions get lifted, we uh, will be welcoming more folks to come by Adam HQ to play with the arm in person in the San Francisco Bay Area as well. In the meantime, you can find us at adamlims.com. Thank you. I need to get to the last part of it, but I finally got my situation sorted here. I apologize for that. <laughs> so good, David. All right. Well, hey, uh, Tyler, great pitch. Um, thank you so much for that. Uh, let's go uh, same order. Eric, um, if you have any questions, feedback for Tyler on his startup. Yeah, Tyler, uh, good, good job, good pitch. Um, get a question about, uh, you didn't touch that much on, on unit economics, right, and the cost of the prosthetic, and then also what's, what's the lifetime, right, of, of uh, you know, uh, of a prosthetic arm? How often do, do you think it needs to be replaced, and what's the cost of use or you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we breezed over that slide fairly quickly. So they are about $100,000 a piece. That's pretty much what you charge today for the most advanced prosthetics. So that's not really breaking the bank for insurance. They, they'll go up to even $200,000. Um, so what we do is we come in at that $100,000 price point and then just offer a ton more value, like I was saying. Um, in terms of, sorry, was the other part of what you asked? Uh, just in terms of, uh, you've got, oh, it's lifetime. harder, right? Yeah. Yeah. So lifetime is typically three to five years expected use for sort of any prosthetic. We're aiming for five to 10 um, and we're on track for that. All of the, <clears throat> all the early hardware design and development on this was done by uh, military contractors. So it's incredibly robust. The arm itself already meets basically like IP 65, potentially 67 certification. Um, so when I say arm, I mean the arm, not the hand. Yeah. I guess you wouldn't know that. Um, and, um, and then insurance is, is pretty well aligned with that too. Insurance basically says, Hey, amputee, you can get a new one after three years, but you can't get one after one year. So you go for that sort of three to five year period. Okay. And, and then a uh, second question before I hand it off, uh, in terms of, can you just dive a little deeper in, in terms of go to market and sales channels? Yeah. Um, go to, go to market sales channel, basically. You know, imagine uh, there's this there's this network of people called prosthetists. Um, they're not clinicians. They're sort of car salesmen slash car mechanics, and uh, they exist all over the cities we live in. You know, next to your dog supply store or a Seven Eleven, and you go in as an amputee. The doctor wrote a prescription. You take it to them, and then basically they actually help you get fitted, figure out the right device for you to get. And so what we do is we partner with all the major um, prosthetic clinics and those prosthetists in the major urban areas. So it's places called Hanger Clinic or Advanced Arm Dynamics. We don't have any official partnerships to like announce there or anything. We're in early conversations with all of them. They're all very excited. Um, and then on the military side, obviously there's the VA, which is, which is their own sales channel, but it's very different than civilians. Okay, thank you. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, uh, Tyler, this is David. How fragmented is that clinic market? I mean, are there, you know, 10 in every major city where, you know, you have to go one by one to these folks? Or is there is there any channel there to those, those guys? Yeah, these are great questions, guys. Um, basically, it's it's fragmented in terms of the number of institutions that exist, but actually it turns out that there's three of them that have 80% of the arm amputee population. And so working with Advanced Arm Dynamics and Hangar and then the VA is, is really the way to go. Um, and then, you know, sadly, sort of fortunately slash unfortunately, you know, most arm amputees live in the in or near the major urban areas like the West Coast with LA and San Francisco or the East Coast, DC, you get a lot of military there. And then in the Texas area, actually, specifically, there's a, a place called the Center for Intrepid, which does a lot of really great work with Army amputees. So it's it's sort of the blessing and the curse of, you know, only going after a market of only a couple hundred thousand people is, you know, they're fairly centrally located in a few places. Okay, great. And then you mentioned the two year, two years to commercialization. Where are you in that cycle and what, what is that two year going to comprise of? Yeah, so the R&D was about 15 years. That got us up till now. And now we are uh, two to potentially three years because of COVID away from being in market. And what that looks like is to the tune of financially, probably about another 20 million to get to market. We are employing basically a 50-50 funding strategy. So for every dollar we bring in of dilutive, we're raising a dollar non-dilutive through government grants. That would be DOD, NASA, NIH, NSF. We have a bunch of applications and relationships in place right now. Um, and then in terms of actually getting the product out to people into their hands, so to speak, uh, that just looks like a lot of user iteration and testing the, during the prototyping phase, as well as on the reimbursement pathway and the regulatory pathway, getting FDA clearance, we would be a class two device. Um, and then on the billing and coding side, that looks like basically going through all the same billing codes that exist in the L code section of the DME spec, um, and then uh, adding any new codes if we need to, but probably just using miscellaneous codes. I realize this might be a few wonky terms there, so please forgive me for using some, some wonky health insurance terms. <laughs> no, that's okay. Okay, and tell me, tell me just tell, what, what's the, I may, may have missed this by not seeing a lot of the beginning of the, the pitch, but what is the core of your, uh, what is the core technology that's driving this mind controlled uh, tech? Yeah, there's really three things real quick. So one is basically this little piece right here, which is an EMG band. You can actually sort of see the electrodes inside there. What you do is you literally put this on your arm. You think signals travel down brain, spinal cord, nerve. This hears them emanating through your muscles, which sends them over to the robotic arm, which leads to the second proprietary thing, which is the AI that's embedded in the firmware of the robotic arm, which takes those signals, has profiled your body, and then moves accordingly intuitively in real time, just as you would. You could you can play a piano if you want. You wouldn't you wouldn't be able to play Beethoven, you know, but you could you could plunk some stuff out. You could do Amazing Grace. And then the third thing is the actual robotics, the oily bits, let's call it. So you know your actuators, your gearboxes. Uh, not everything in there is super pr proprietary, but definitely the actuators and the gearboxes and some of the uh, the connectors and the interconnects are. Um, and those are things we will probably you know never really give away. Uh, and that's also exactly why at the very end I was saying we have line of sight to making a leg, uh, because we can repurpose all those same parts to make a leg. And I don't want to promise it, but you know certainly things like spines and other things that you control as a human too. Same general concept there. You're just actuating things and thinking to do it. And is that does is there is there I guess machine learning in this application? I mean, is there uh, does the does the device actually learn your signals and what it actually wants you to do through some feedback mechanism so that it perfects it, that yep. over time? Quite literally, what we do is when you put that band on and you attach the arm, we put an app on your iPhone. You open up the app and then it says, "All right, try imagine closing with your phantom limb." close your grip, open your grip, move your different fingers, and we train it to those, and then it basically develops a profile of you. Um, and that takes about two to five minutes to do. So it's, it's extremely fast now. All right, interesting. All right. Yeah, Thank cool. you. Thanks, David. Nice, great questions. Um, Eric, any follow-up questions from you? And then I'm gonna go ahead and pull one from the audience. Yeah, just maybe just just long term future, right? So you've got prosthetic arm, you've got the leg potentially, and then do you see any other applications uh, uh, and maybe even licensing the technology to some other potential industry se segments? Yeah, fantastic question, Eric, for sure. I, I think we think about that a lot and we try to sort of hold it off a little bit, admittedly, too. Uh, we have a fair amount of inbound from 
what we call the robotics 2.0 space. So while we're trying to be human body 2.0 right now, there's certainly a lot of big ag, uh, thermo, you know, nuclear de reactor decommissioning agencies, um, you know, deep water diving robots. There's all sorts of areas like that where they're really looking for a human scale, highly dexterous hand and arm, but where you don't want a human, you just want a human in the loop. Um, so absolutely we're interested in going into those places and over time we'll just be entertaining more of those conversations as it stands right now we are 100 percent laser focused on getting this one first tesla roadster of an arm basically to market first before anything else okay thanks mm -hmm. thank you so this is great so we have like one minute left um and actually i want to ask this question because it was a similar question to what i wanted to ask you personally um, cause this is, this is, I mean, just starting companies in general is really tough. This in <laughs> specifically sounds extremely hard, um, to really go through so what's like the genesis yeah. for inventing this. Do you have any background or connection to amputees or, you know, what's the why for this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this is way easier than a SaaS software startup. Um, the, the impetus here is basically very selfishly. I want to cure death and live forever. And I want to give everyone that ability to live as long as they want, as healthy as they want. Um, and so I myself was basically advising and, and slightly angel investing in longevity and anti-aging companies while running my previous company um, and came across this. And, and, you know, we got involved with the Hopkins folks and we put together a fantastic team. But um, really, you know, this is the first step to get to that human body 2.0. Moonshot companies absolutely are hard. Yes, uh, that's exactly why we have a team of ex NASA, ex Apple folks, you know, to, to make that a reality. Um, you cannot step into this, you know, short change, shorthanded at all. Totally. Great. Well, hey, Tyler, we appreciate your time. Um, great questions from the panelists. Thank you. Um, so next up, pitching with us, we have Jessica Bledsoe with uh, Paver. Hi everyone, my name is Jessica Bledsoe and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Paver. Paver is a web-based application that leverages your calendar data to help you get more done in less time. Juggling the demands of both our careers and our personal lives is often a balancing act for all of us, but especially for small businesses and their teams who are doing all the things all the time. As a result, more than 70% of businesses are using digital calendars to help them manage their time. But the reality is, even though we're using those calendars to plan nearly every moment of our lives, we still often find ourselves wondering where our time actually went. That's because the calendar has become so much more than just an appointment tool. For many small businesses, it's a tool they use for goal setting, time tracking, and even project planning and management. They're already using the calendar and collecting the data, but there's never really been a way for them to organize or view that data in a way that makes sense. And if we're already tracking the most valuable resource we have, which is our time, shouldn't we be able to leverage that information to make more informed decisions? This is exactly the problem that Paper is seeking to solve, helping our customers understand where their time went by providing them with valuable insights and analytics into where and how, so they can use that data not only to make better decisions, but to get business done faster. Paver is a Google Calendar add-on meaning it can be installed directly from your Google Calendar web app and accessed straight from any calendar event. Once installed, Paver provides three primary features, color-coded categories, event labels, and the ability to export calendar details to a Google Sheet. As you can see in this report, once exported, Paver aggregates all of the data to generate a report detailing exactly how their time was spent. In this user's case, they spent 18% of their month in meetings. What if eliminating some of that excessive meeting time meant increasing billable hours and thus revenue? My co-founder Adam and I started Paver because we saw a need. We spent nearly a decade running a service-based business, helping small businesses integrate and automate their business processes using Google's business tools like Google Calendar. But time and again, we found ourselves needing to either add more information into a calendar event to help them keep track of the important details or they needed to extract information out of the calendar to generate reports like timesheets, invoices, mileage reports, or just other documents that they needed. After more than a year of searching for a solution to that calendar problem, we just decided to create the solution ourselves. Since launching Paver in April, 
We've acquired nearly 5,000 users in more than 20 countries around the world completely organically through our unique listing in the Google Marketplace. We are ready to take what we've learned from these users and grow Paver, but we need your help. We've raised more than $70,000 on the equity crowdfunding platform WeFunder, and combined with a $30,000 pitch competition win, we've secured more than $100,000. But our campaign is ongoing through January 30th, and we really welcome any additional investments to help us close out our round. If you'd like to learn more about Paver or our WeFunder campaign, please feel free to reach out or check out our WeFunder profile at wefunder.com backslash Paver. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks. Great, great pitch, Jessica. Um, let's flip it a little bit. David, we'll start with you on any questions or feedback. Okay. Yes. So Jessica, um, in your report of time spent and pulling that from the calendar, I, ca I captured that part, but what, what does your application do sort of real time while, while I'm working? Does it, you know, what, what, how does it, in, um, I guess, help me at that time versus help me look, look at where I'm spending my time and then making adjustments later. So, so what's the real time aspect of this? Yeah, so at the immediate moment, um, it's really relying on you to put that data into the calendar and then tell it exactly what it is. What we're working on for our next development update, however, is to include a timer that you can start that will actually run on top of that calendar event so you can capture the actual time that you spend in a meeting or just working on your project, creating a proposal, whatever it is that you've allotted for that calendar entry so that you don't have to manually update it. And then also implementing some learning so that it knows that um, if I put a meeting in at this day and this time, it's usually this, or if I'm meeting with this person, it's usually categorized as this so that it starts to learn um, your behaviors and can update it automatically without so much interaction from you. Okay. And does, is this something that you know that if if you have it as an add-on to your google calendar and let's say your google calendar is sh shared internally with your co-worker can he also see i mean do they interact his yeah, app so and your app uh, together yeah so you have a domain install option so that all the calendars that are connected to that domain you can set up um, administrator roles where you all have um, the same categories or labels, but from an individual perspective, you can add your own, um, however you can see and interact with other people's as well. Okay. And, and what's your business model? Is this a plug-in price or is this a, how, how are you charging? Yeah, it's a subscription model. So it's charged um, per user per month or on an annual basis um, based on how many seats you need for your company. Okay. And current traction? Uh, so we're actually pre-revenue right now. Our monetization plan will take effect in um, March. And at that point, um, you know, we hope to be generating some revenue. However, we've got some features we want to implement before we start making that a, a paid app. Okay, got it. Okay. Great. Next. Eric, over to you. Yeah, Jessica, good presentation. Um, this is a really busy space, right? Uh, you know, uh, productivity apps in general, timekeeping, project management, uh, calendaring, right? So how do you, what's your strategy to stand out, right, long term and really go above the fray? I mean, you mentioned the Google Marketplace. Are there any other sales and marketing strategies you have? Yeah, so I mean, obviously, it's it's no secret that there are an endless supply of productivity apps out there that you can mm -hmm. use. But, you know, through our work with, small businesses primarily and and what we did with those small businesses was helping them integrate the Google products that were they were using with their other systems like CRMs and the other productivity apps that they had but the problem was always that either they were paying for an app that was just so robust that they were only using 30% of the features they were never taking the time to actually set it up and use it and then when it came time to actually get the entire team on board with it it was, I mean, it, it was basically impossible for small businesses where they're, you know, they're doing all the things. They don't have specific departments to do that. And so our thought process behind that was to integrate it with Google Calendar because that's the tool they're already using. They're already putting all of that data into the calendar. They're relying so heavily on it. Um, and then the long-term goal there is to start to also integrate the app with some of those CRMs that they're using so they can begin to pull that data into the CRM and create more robust ways to collect the data. But for the small businesses that aren't at that point where they don't need a sales force, 
it's a way for them to get all of their data in there into an app that they're already familiar with and using. Okay. Do you, do you have any plans uh, outside with Microsoft, let's say, or do you do you plan to stick strictly to Google for now? Uh, you know, never say never, but it's it's not really on our roadmap at this at this point. We we're really um, confident in Google, and that's just what we know and what we're familiar with. So we want to make that as strong as possible before we look at other avenues. Okay. Uh, final question: Can you talk about your team a bit more, yourself and um, your I guess other team members, and then why why are you doing this? Yeah. So it's myself and uh, my co-founder is Adam. He's our CTO. Mm. He's actually my husband. Um, and so we started a service-based business about a decade ago, what I was mentioning, where we were helping uh, small businesses migrate to Google Cloud, teaching them how to use it, how to take advantage of all the different time-saving tools that it offered, introducing them to automation, and um, you know, just helping them save time through that. And we just kept encountering this problem with the calendar over and over and over again. And we spent some time, I mean, we spent quite a bit of time looking for a solution. And you know, kind of piecing some things together that would work for some people, but not others. And it finally got to the point where we were like, why, why don't we just build this product that we're looking for ourselves and create something that we know we need because we're service providers and our customers need. Um, and then now we've just fully transitioned into, into Paver and, and don't have that service-based business anymore, but we have those relationships and those are some of our really early adopters. And I'm getting a lot of really wonderful feedback from them because they're being super transparent about the app and how they're using it and what, what would make it better for them as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, great. Thank you so much, Jessica. Appreciate yeah, thank you guys. your attention today. Um, there will be a link where you guys can go check out a little more information on Paver and Jessica, her team, um, really exciting stuff. Next up, we have Jonathan Spangler with Ciari Guitars. Music has been central to my life since I've been knee high. My professional day job was a, as a patent attorney. I was a business traveler, I traveled 40 plus times a year and had to tote my guitar. It was terrible and so wanted to have a real guitar. This here is the Ascender, my favorite guitar. You might be thinking, why? Well, there's a little something under the hood that most people don't understand. This thing goes from a full-size, normal look, feel, play, 24 and 3 quarter inch scale, 22 fret guitar, to a folded state that literally goes into a backpack that can fit under the seat in front of you during air travel. So for the first time, stress-free guitar air travel with the Ascender. The main parts of the Ascender that allow it to fold three things in combination. Number one, you have a hinge of the 12th fret. Number two, you have an actuator that tensions and detensions the strings. And number three, you have a translating truss rod that locks and unlocks that hinge. So with the throw of a lever that's hidden while you're playing, it will detension the strings, unlock that hinge, and allow the strings to follow the fold under light tension, about three pounds, while it folds in half. Our design thinking on this was extremely intentional. We wanted the front experience to be normal, traditional. We respect the history and heritage of guitars. Two years in earnest of engineering, hardcore engineering, where we hired medical device engineers, people who are used to doing hips and knees and implants for the spine, where it has to work every time for a lifetime. The technology behind the Ascender is what makes this a guitar and not a gimmick. The problem of guitar inconvenience goes way beyond air travel. It impacts all modes of mobility, autos, motorcycles, RVs, boats, and yachts. Uh, and most people, as a result, simply leave their guitars at home. They deprive themselves and others the joy and power of music. Uh, we, with our Ascender, have made some great waves since we first came on the scene. Um, media blitz, including Forbes, um, lauded as the most convenient guitar in the world. Guitar Player Magazine gave us the coveted editor's pick, uh, saying that we had the only and the first ever um, pro-quality travel guitar. Um, very high praise. Um, our first year of um, sit revenue, about 150,000, north of 40 guitars. Um, we have a great team of uh, with the, the right skill set, and we have a, a world-class advisory board with pedigrees from names like Gibson Guitars and Guitar Center and the number one you know, rated luthier guitar maker uh, in the country, in a guy named Joe Glazer out of Nashville. 
um, we are going to disrupt the approximately $3 billion global guitar market. And we're going to do that by having that uh, premium and then segmenting down to having those mid-tier offerings. Uh, electric, carbon fiber, acoustic, and then even a bass guitar in due course. Uh, so we'd love to have you on our journey of disruption. Help us unleash the power of music. Thanks for your consideration. I'd love to chat. All right. Also, Jonathan, mm -hmm. great pitch. Um, love the video. Um, I don't play guitar. Wish I kind of did. So after that, maybe I'll pick it up. Uh, Eric, let's start with you. Any questions or feedback? You're mute. You're muted, by the way, Eric. There you go. All right, uh, Jonathan, great pitch. <laughs> Again, oh, um, uh, just a few, few questions. Uh, you spent a lot of time on the product, right? It looks really interesting. So, so uh, in terms of product, why has no one done this before, first of all? Uh, second is, you know, a lot of times when you uh, design this type of product, sometimes you're giving something up in addition to adding something cool, right? So uh, what are, the, are there any potential trade-offs here, right, in terms of sound quality or, or anything else that guitar aficionados may, may care about? Sure. Great questions, and thank you. Um, first question in terms of, um, uh, let's see, I think you were, the, forgive me, but the first question had to do with, um, uh, just why, why has no one done this before if, if it's such a big problem yeah. yeah so so why they haven't done it i mean frankly because uh it's a pretty daunting thing to go up the neck and matter of fact there's a a, a new friend of mine at, at gibson who who complimented us after we launched it and he said it took someone from outside the industry to do this because we all know you never mess with a neck and so it's kind of like no man's land uh, just historically, you don't mess with the neck. Um, we didn't know better. We engineered the jeepers out of it, and uh, and it and it, it it frankly, to our great surprise, um, not only performs at the same level as pro play, you know, premium guitars, U.S. made. Um, you know, it has that extra. Obviously, it has that extra element of convenience. But the Guitar Player magazine that I referenced in the uh, in the pitch. Uh, was really, you know, uh, a, a massive inflection point for us because they basically said, "You aren't this. This is not a compromise," and that has always been the case. That uh, if it's convenient, <clears throat> it's there's some sort of um, there's something you're leaving on the table. So that's a that's an excellent question. Um, you know, we're we're pretty excited about um, about you know our niche. Um, you know, there are travel guitars out there, but none have had mid-neck folding. The mid-neck folding is important because it's only by the mid-neck. You know, you can see it, if you will, here. Um, the the mid-neck is what makes it symmetrical. And and there is one other guitar that was a, a folding guitar on Shark Tank, season one, and it uh, it was it was both a blessing and a curse. It socialized the notion of a folding guitar. They missed the mark on quality, so that's our opportunity to come in and say we finally got it right. Okay, and then uh, final question before I hand it over. You mentioned it's a three billion dollar global guitar market you're disrupting, right? But you also said this is a niche market, right, for for traveling guitar. So what's the size of that niche market you're going after? Uh, another great question. So um, the this, the service addressable market for us is is about eight hundred and thirty three million of that overall three billion, and that's because this performs toe-to-toe uh, uh, -to -toe with a traditional guitar. So yes, we are market making within the smaller subset of travel. Travel is the niche and we are defining a, a new strata within travel, but we go toe-to-toe -to -toe with, with good guitars. And I think that's where we've had, um, you know, in our strategy has been influenced by what people are telling us who are artists and in the industry. And they basically, you know, we have multiple people say, damn, I wish I'd have seen this before I bought my Les Paul because you have a Nashville made great, and we don't have the brand of, of Gibson and Les Paul and you, you can't go back in time. But from a quality standpoint, you can deliver exactly what they expect when they're playing. Um, and so that's why we feel like we actually have uh, a bona fide opportunity to bring about uh, guitar convenience and and uh, and quality that again 
heretofore has not been, um, you know, they've been mutually exclusive before. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, Jonathan. So I had a similar question in regards to the market because you mentioned that you're going to the higher end. And I, my first question was that I, I got I got it because you, know, you want the product to be as high quality as possible. But it seems to me that this would appeal more to people who are almost beginners and people that see this to say, okay, now that would be easy for me to, to, to carry around with me. Therefore, I'm going to try a guitar because it doesn't seem yeah. such, like such a clunky thing. Do you think there's a down market play? And you mentioned more of that down market in your strategy, but why isn't that first? Sort of like right there versus later. Yeah, again, great question, David. And it's and it's because uh, the way we we looked at this at time one, we have one chance to establish the brand, and we and we 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 sought to go more narrow and establish it as a premium. And that's what the the that's how important that Guitar Player Magazine review was for us. It was like check the box. So you know we joke we're the Tesla of travel guitars. You come in at time one, establish your brand then go to segment down okay. and that's what we're doing right now makes sense uh, the other thing is is not a question it's more of an idea and that is you know obviously you're you've got the channels in, in the music world the, the guitar stores the on you know all that kind of stuff but when i look at somebody that would think this is really cool somebody that probably barely just picking around with a guitar but would say i'm gonna get that and i'm gonna spend money on it is is and and Jonathan's probably one of these guys, but you know the skater dudes, the surfer dudes that are you know buying the the or or the fifty year old like uh, uh, mid mid uh, mid career what do you call them mid age crisis, crisis that are buying all the to me to, not the to me but the what are the the cooler company the um you know what I mean jet yeah, uh, yeah. Z, Zeti or Jetty Yeti. Um, you know, marketing and selling at those kind of retailers that it's like, wow, that's cool. I want to learn how to play guitar, you know, mm -hmm. so sort of going outside of your key market at the same price point. Once you establish this brand and yeah. attracting it, people, because it's a cool, it's a cool concept. Uh, well, and I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and matter of fact, you know, in a, in a three minute pitch, it's it's pretty hard to get all the stuff in. But one of the things that we um, we already have are dialogues with um, motorcycle dealers, you know, to actually have a PlayStation in a motorcycle dealership so that people right. understand that motorcycles and music is not mutually exclusive. You can put this guitar into a saddlebag. Um, right. Exactly. Fact, That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Yeah. And and uh, uh, I have a conversation with a yacht dealer here in San Diego. Again, same thing. You're spending three million dollars on a on a yacht. Um, you know, having a, a, a really cool three thousand dollar guitar, that's that's uh, a rounding error, right? So great, great idea. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're, I think that's a that's a that's a sort of a marketing ploy for you at some point. Yeah. But appreciate it. But an interesting yeah. product. Thanks, Jonathan. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Nice, thanks. So we're a little running over time. I want to ask more questions. I'll have some more questions, and I think we have some more questions from uh, the panelists and the audience, uh, but we're going to send them over to you, Jonathan, after this, and we're going to go to the next company. Okay. Um, hey, we appreciate you. Uh, we appreciate your time. Sick product. Love it. Hey, it's my pleasure. Sincerely, like, guys. Thank you so much. I learned how to play the guitar. I'm going to get one. Um, <laughs> hopefully, I'll learn how to play like 30 seconds of a right. You, you have a beautiful head of hair. At least you gotta you gotta uh, play guitar too. You know, first time I've ever gotten that compliment in my life. <laughs> <laughs> towards me. Um, all right. Well, hey, perfect. Thank you, Jonathan. We're gonna go to our last startup company. I'm definitely not least, but uh, we are having Charlie Brown, Charles Brown, uh, with Clicks. Hi, I'm Leilani Macedo, co-founder and president of Clicks. And I'm Charles Brown, the CEO, and we've invented the world's first digital hair color studio and pay after dispense color as a service. With over 30 years of experience in the professional salon industry, and as a previous salon owner, I was able to identify three key issues with managing the expensive hair color inventory. It's service quality, inventory management itself, and then waste, which was impacting my profitability by 20 to 40%. I went out to the industry to find a solution, and there wasn't one, so I decided to solve it. 
I recruited a team of engineers, filed a provisional patent, and had a prototype device to set out to find a CEO that could help me commercialize the product. So we met by pure circumstance. I needed a haircut, found myself in her chair. She pitched the idea, and immediately I knew it had great potential. We worked together, launched the business in January of 16, and fast forward, we've raised $5.3 million. With that money, we've invented the world's first line of mixable MEA hair color, the first patented digital hair color dispenser, and a platform that ties it all together. We launched commercially in January of this year. We've had quarter to quarter increasing revenue, and we've even closed a strategic partnership with one of the largest beauty companies in the world. We're excited to work with WeFunder to help raise this next round of capital and help the company get to the next major milestones. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, great pitch. Charles, appreciate it. I keep calling you Charlie by mistake. Charlie Brown, Charles Brown. I don't know if you go by that. Sorry. <laughs> it's, it comes out. <laughs> um, well, again, love the pitch. Uh, let's start off with some questions and feedback. Um, David, if you want to give it a start. Sure, yeah. I, I'm, I'm curious, what is, the, what is the digital component of this? Because I, I really didn't quite capture that. So, so we have a, a mobile application. I'll grab my phone here. And I'll show it to you, and it's a it's a complete uh, workflow for stylists. And so, so this is our, our mobile application, and this particular screen happens to be the the breakthrough capability, where what you can do for the very first time in in a in a uh, oxidative hair color is non-linear, meaning it's difficult to compute. So what we've done is we've set it up so that you could literally pull any of the components out of the colors and it will compute the actual color that you're designing for a client. And so this is a complete mobile workflow application that lets you design custom colors for your clients and then name those colors, store them in digital libraries and then service them repeatedly with that custom color. Okay, and so, but how do you, I guess, is there some calibration method to make sure that that, uh... That color is is you know accurate from what that person is viewing. Uh, very much so. So what we've done is we've taken each of those uh, components. So so uh, let me step back for a second. The current world of hair color is premixed colors. Uh, the typical manufacturer will offer about 120 tones, and you can contrast this with let's say Home Depot Paint Center, where you can go in with a paint swatch or you can pick from the 5,000. And then you go grab a can of white paint, base paint, and then they squirt in the different dyes. So basically, this is kind of like a Home Depot paint center meets professional salon hair color. Heretofore, it's all been you know pre-made colors, and so they have limited color choice. What we did is we first created, which is an incredibly difficult thing to do, a a line of oxidative mixable hair color, and then we used high-end. $25,000 optical scanning technology to scan it. And then we put those scans through a neural network that we've tuned to be able to compute what any color will be based on any mix of colors that we can produce with our 25 unique tones. And so this is a breakthrough in that for the very first time, it allows any stylist, and there are a million across the United States, to be sitting next to a client, ask the client what color they'd like, the custom design a color, show it to them, they select it, and then our dispenser will mix our combination of colors to give them the exact color that they want. You know, in the current world, some product manager from L'Oreal in France is designing the 120 colors and say, this is all you get. Got it, okay. And how's your traction so far? Are you, are you in salons now? Um, so yeah, so we just entered salons. We're getting really good positive results. We're growing rapidly. We have an $8 million pipeline of demand. Um, and we just uh, inked a deal with one of the largest beauty companies in the world who wants to put their hair color to the platform because they, they realize they can do the same thing. And here's the really cool thing about this, David. Their CEO, this is a Japanese conglomerate, their CEO said sustainability is incredibly important to them. It's in the middle of their website. With our technology, they're able to take their 139 tones and they have to produce volume around the world because they're in 140 countries and 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 produce all those and ship them all over the world. With ours, they've already proven themselves 
that they're gonna be able with 25 tones to deliver those 139 to all their customers and dramatically shrink their supply chain. Plus, and here's the big piece, our canisters, we figured out how to uniquely barcode every single canister. And so when we put them in our dispenser, the dispenser reads that barcode and knows ex exactly what kind of color it is. And it knows how much it dispenses by the gram, so it tracks it. And then it auto reorders from the factory. But what we realized we could do is we, we could design the pick, pack, and ship at the factory to read this unique barcode, to send it through our platform to the dispenser so the dispenser knows when it's going to show up. And then we could create a barcode that goes onto the box full of these so that we could literally track every single can through the entire supply chain. We know when it's on order, when it gets picked, when it's en route to a salon, when it gets to the salon because they signed for it. So it's pre-staged, you know, when it goes into the machine and we know when it's empty and it goes out of the machine. So we have what the big beauty companies are telling us is a complete step change in sustainability for the supply chain and full visibility. And we have it online in a reporting system that's real time. So quite literally, I can click on, you know, any SKU and see how much I have in any any position in the entire supply chain. Got it. Just uh, I'll leave I'll leave you with this. Um, I was an investor in a product company called BlowPro, which actually started the whole blow dry bar concept. Mm -hmm. But they went they went on the product side versus the retail side, mm -hmm. and uh, they were acquired by a group called the Beauty Elite Group or something like that out of Texas, I think, mm -hmm. early on. Yes. Put that. Um, Put that company in your head because they might be a potential partner or um beauty elite group i think is the name of the it was years ago but, oh uh, and that's my very limited experience in anything that has to do with a salon <laughs> interesting so as i started you know to to build the business i reached out to some analysts making markets for regis and some of the other big chains um, and then i reached out to an investment banker down in LA who runs a beauty practice. And I said, I think we're creating a new category. Is that true? They said, absolutely the case. And then this investment, <clears throat> that the closest comp is a company called Sayuki, Custom Cosmetics. They built a machine that uses an optical sensor to sense skin color and then creates foundation makeup that matches you know, the skin color, right? So you don't have those, those, those makeup lines. They were founded in 2012 uh, by 2014, they created their first commercial prototype, and L'Oreal jumped in and bought them for 150 million bucks at that. And so he said, Sayuki is your closest comp, and you're really well positioned because all of the beauty companies are moving towards custom cosmetics and technology, right? Beauty tech, and and none of them have it in Yeah, and personalization, yeah. No. yeah. Thanks. Oh, yeah, I, uh, Charles, good, good presentation. Uh, I'm, I probably know less about salons than David does, <laughs> but uh, so so question about um, just in terms of can you help me understand the unit economics uh, of these d devices and, and cost and price, and then also if I'm a salon owner, right? What are the what are the cost savings potentially for me, and and potentially cost of switching as well? Sure. So uh, so so let me take the unit economics first. Mm -hmm. and I talk both on the color side because this is our recurring revenue right um, this holds 245 grams each gram is MSRP for 18 cents and it costs me 1.2 cents to produce so so I've got just you know I've got 80 percent gross margins including the packaging you know and shipping out to the salons a uh, typical salon buys about fifty thousand dollars a year worth of color um, so that means that I'm going to have about uh, forty thousand dollars per salon customer in gross profit, which is very attractive. They buy year in and year out. So that's a, a really wonderful thing. From a machine standpoint, uh, each machine costs us about 3,000 to produce. We put in two machines per salon, so it's about six grand. I capitalize that and can finance it. Uh, I have another about $1,300 that it costs me to bring up the salon in terms of the initial inventory we provide to them, the shipping cost and the training cost. My ROI over five years is 2,200%. Uh, with these salons. It's a really, really attractive business in terms of you know, throwing off the cash. Um, and now to your last question in terms of adoption. What we figured out how to do with that optical scanning capability in the neural net is to not only swatch our stuff and figure out how to compute it, but swatch the competitor's tones, because all the competitor's tones are different, right? And we can figure out 
we can say, oh, you like L'Oreal Professional 6N? Push this conversion button on our mobile application and we'll create, use our formula to create the equivalent color. And that turns out to be really, really huge for the following reason. Say I'm a salon owner, I've got 40 stylists. Each of those 40 stylists come to me from different salons, different experience, different background. They've all used different manufacturers' colors. They get used to those colors and it really takes a lot of time to learn a new color line. So, so you have like a, a learning curve, which by the way is a, is a sales problem, right? Because, mm -hmm. because stylists, you know, don't want to have to learn new color. And so we can sell the salon owner really efficiently to your other question because we reduce waste by 30%. And that 30% waste reduction is equal to 20 to 40% of the profit of a typical salon. Huge, right? And the reason is these tubes, they're designed to be wasteful. You squeeze it all out. You don't want to go back and mix more. So, so and I'll tell you how we saw that in a minute and it's patented. And so and the, the problem is though, we can come in and we can say, hey, we salon owner, we can improve your profits by 30%. But then they turn to the stylist and the stylist goes, oh, I don't want to learn a new color line. But we can then say, well, we have conversion charts for each of the major competitors. And so we all of a sudden can satisfy all the different stylists, all of which they're used to using different color lines, right? And, and salons can't afford to hold all that inventory. So what we did as part of our design and our dispenser is we created something called a smart bowl. There's an RFID tag here. And when I design a an application for a client initially, what I do is I go in and I create their profile and I set how long their hair is. We have default dispense amounts for that. But after the first dispense for the client, what happens is this goes in, it dispenses, I apply it to the client. Any leftover color I put back into the dispenser, it weighs it and it reduces the historic record of that client by that amount so that for their next dispense, it'll dispense exactly the right amount of color for each client. So the system learns and that's what eliminates the waste and increases their profitability. And so give you, let me give you some specific numbers because it turns out one of my close family friends, I didn't realize until I got into this, has run a salon and has been like a top 200 salon today, magazine salon for like 12 years. And I went to Gail and I said, Gail, I've met someone, they've got a great idea. I'm thinking about investing and going in and run the company. You know, what do you think is this idea? She said, if you can do that, you will revolutionize the space. And she said, I spend $100,000 a year on color and my profit is $80,000. If you can save me $30,000 in hair color, I'm a happy camp. So that kind of gives you a sense of the-, of the I'm, sure, the okay. I'm sure anyone would be a happy camper there. Um, Charles, I appreciate it. Eric, if you have any additional follow-up questions to that, i um, happy to connect you to. Um, that's our goal here and what we're trying to accomplish and what we're trying to do. Um, we're up on time. Um, so Charles, super great pitch. Um, David, Eric, love the feedback. It was amazing. Um, and everyone out there, uh, thank you so much for sticking around and joining us uh, for the second pitch party show. Keep a lookout in your inbox. Uh, next few days, you'll see an invite coming your way for a really, really cool and exciting pitch competition called The Greatest Damn Pitch uh, that we're lucky enough to be able to coordinate production with. Um, also, keep an eye out in your inbox for the Startup Lookbook, where you'll be able to see an overview of each startup that pitched today on this show. Um, in the spirit of paying it forward, uh, we would love for you all to walk away from this with, you know, just making a connection, an introduction, a follow up with at least one of these great uh, companies and entrepreneurs. Uh, have a great rest of your night. See you next time. We'll have five more companies uh, join us in the hut. Take care. Thank you all. Bye now. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.